In the first fifteen, chapter five, Chroma Works Limited. My father had generously paid for a weekly train ticket, an action meant to demonstrate to me the confidence he had in my ability to hold down my first job. He was very much of the old school, and whilst I was looking forward to a bohemian lifestyle, he, understanding the ways of the world, looked towards my dedication and perseverance to set me up for a lifetime of work. Ever since leaving home, my thoughts consumed by doubts and fear, every part of me charged with foreboding. My walk, dodging in and out of the streams of workers down Station Road, Neasden, took me away from the railway station, past the bombed-out sidings and good yards that stretched as far as Wembley. The soot-blackened factory walls hiding behind spear-headed railings the endless rows of terraced Victorian villas bravely advanced upon the pavement, their geranium-filled window-boxes trying to lend colourful distraction from the all-too-obvious bomb damage. A poster-hung hoarding exclaimed by stark design the virtues of Purcell's whitening powder and Tetley's superior leaf promoted by a colourful plantation scene which gave colour and softened the aspect. Eventually I reached the factory gate. Peering out from behind the grill of a small inquiry hatch, a portly gatekeeper acknowledged my knock. He was attired in a patched warehouse coat, gripping a rolled-up cigarette between his few stained teeth, who croaked a gruff, What you want? And my fears returned. I thrust out my letter. Mr. Oppenheimer's elaborate hand graced the paper. I made my first utterance since leaving home. Here, sir. The door opened. I reluctantly squeezed in. My working life began. The gatekeeper showed me the clocking-in procedure having found my card, and then marched me down the long corridor which followed the whole length of the factory to the artist department. There a grey painted sliding door opened onto a room furnished with eight six feet by ten feet wooden tables, several racks of metal plates, and a small anteroom which contained the foreman's toilet and storeroom. He introduced me to the foreman. Mr. Brian Porter, whom I had met before at my interview. He, in turn, introduced me to Charlie Coburn, the eldest in the room. Although past retirement age, he had elected to stay on. At one time he had been the foreman. Reg Passy held the position of unpaid deputy, and Bruce Ormerand, the second eldest and the mode most irascible. Frank Clements, the lettering artist, and finally to Eric Campbell, the ex-apprentice, who had just served an extra year's apprenticeship to improve his skills. I was then shown to an empty bench, to be mine, and to the storeroom cupboard, my responsibility. It had been explained to me at the interview that I was to serve a trial period and that if then I, I was to be accepted, my indenture, indentures would be signed and sealed, binding, the binding a document made by the master and apprentice, stating the terms and conditions, and they would be witnessed. For my duties, I had Eric to show me round, as he was the most sensitive and industrious of fellows. His explanation of my tasks were most detailed and seemed to last for ages. The first thing in my day, every day, was to mix up the ink using an e enamel plate as the mixing container. I had to rub onto it a greasy black wax stick and then by rubbing the tip of my middle finger over the applied wax and using water as the base and by this method a black drawing ink was produced. The consistency of thin cream. My second task was to take the orders for dinners and snacks. 
Chroma Works had an efficient and popular canteen which uh, remained open for the next five years and that was where my love for cheese rolls began. Their rolls freshly baked to a nicety and the butter and cheese unsparingly applied. The Works Drama Group laid on frequent dances and the annual Christmas pantomime. As a whole the firm was a family-run affair and the directors looked upon their factory with a parental responsibility. The workers viewed the firm as a means of employment and social companionship. Chroma Works was self-contained, not only having a canteen but a carpenter's shop, its own engineers and electricians, a resident nurse and social worker and the works painter and decorator. It was efficiently run, clean, freshly painted, windows regularly replaced and cleaned and the industrial site up to date regarding methods of production and delivery of goods. Eric took me on a tour of the factory to every department and every shop introducing me to all the workers. The works employed 60% men and 40% women mostly occupied positions in the warehouse and print finishing. Great care was taken by any man walking through these areas, for the women would call out and barrack them. However, it was all in good fun, and never got out of hand. If any of the machine minders became too fresh, they would soon be slapped down. The women, sheet feeders who fed the paper into the grippers of the large machines, worked on platforms above ground, and the men passing would make a grab for a leg, only to have their hands stood on. Mostly the machine minders were very protective of their women helpers, so there was hardly any problems. Chroma Works was a lithographic printers, a printing house that was able to reproduce in colour all forms of commercial printing work. Their work covered production of the smallest labels right through to the largest posters. The reproduction of drawings, paintings, photographic prints and transparencies reproduced both pho photographically and by hand. A lithographic artist in 1950 was still using the same tools, materials and processes adopted in 1796. He was drawing on the printing surface with a wax crane and ink, either copying a previously painted artwork or making his own drawing. The standing and future development of the industry were not explained to me. That the industry was about to be revolutionised by a new technology, even if, and even if they had, I would not have understood the significance. I was born at the time Kodachrome transparency film was invented, a process giving excellent quality. In 1942, Kodakolor negative film was introduced which brought about the eventual tri-colour separation for colour reproductions. It was during my apprenticeship that this discovery and the inventions that followed was introduced from America. And by 1950 all small colour artworks were reproduced using photographic half-tone principles adopting primary colour filters to separate the tri-colour printing images. Lithographic colour retouchers corrected these separations for their spectral deficiencies. I don't know how much the men understood about the changes that would come about when the film companies introduced their new discoveries and inventions, and even by looking at the American industry you couldn't foretell the future. It has always been surprising to me how backward the Americans are in implementing new advances. Their printing process was lagging behind those of European printing houses. What was sure, because I was there and experienced it, was that in 1956 the hand-drawn poster industry was finished. Photographic film was now produced in large format size with a stable backing. Previously, photographic plate glass size was 30-20 inches. From that moment, a very quick change took place. It was a retrograde step, but customers insisted upon having their work produced using the latest technology. It is obviously obvious that multiple printing improves commercial posters, which were now printed in four colours instead of eight. Overprinting increases depth of colour, allowing self-colours to perfectly match the original and customer's house style. 
these lovely seaside posters on railway platforms would never be seen again. By the 1960s, electronic scanning began to be introduced for black and white newspaper block making using a hell clissograph. This spelt doom and di disaster to the photographic screened halftone images. Still, that was to come later, and although workers began to appreciate what was in the air, these changes were to make the one town power of the camera operator, colour retoucher and lithographic artist and film planner redundant. After my trial period had been successfully completed, three months after starting work, I was invited to the following month's union meeting to hear whether I was going to be allowed to become an apprentice. I stood out the room, outside the room whilst my, my worth was discussed, later allowed back in to hear the verdict by Frank, Frank Clements, the father of the chapel, elected some time before I arrived at the film firm. He continued in this position until the printing strike in 1956. He was my mentor and had taken me under his wing ever since my first day in the works. Frank was an avowed socialist, proclaimed the worth of social care and the brotherhood of man and was not afraid to say so. He frequently stood up to the head office union meeting and declared his position. He was a most caring individual but unfortunately he expected others to be equally strong both in opinion, resolve and care for others. This was all very well but his thinking didn't seem to include consideration for the management and the owners who needed to make a profit. The effects of overseas and homegrown competition nor union strength used undemocratically. Without the use of a sealed ballot to evade undue pressure applied to the opposing union or works committee. The vote was taken without dissension. I was pleased to stay and start my apprenticeship straight away. However, I had to join the union and attend head office and works meetings. I started my five years as an lithographic artist Continuing, continuing very much the methods and techniques used all those years ago in Prague. One of my first tasks after mixing up the ink required for all the artists was to draw a letter C by hand without the use of a compass, large enough to fill a 60 by 40 inch poster plate. The foreman, Mr. Porter, got down on his hands and knees and gazed along the curbs by turning the plate slowly round and if there was the slightest bump or undulation I had to do it all again. I had to do that letter C over a dozen times which took over a week and even then he only allowed me to stop and do something else when there was grumbling from the other men that I was being unfairly treated. This sort of attention to detail followed me in all that I did. No work was accepted unless it was of the very highest standard. Eventually such tasks were commonplace. I had to draw the whole side of a Heinz bean label. That is all the written ingredients, letters that were half an inch high. However, for this I used a ruling pen and compass. These were the first tools I bought and I have them here before me now, a half set of compasses and a ruling pen, so frequently sharpened down that its blades are half their original length. My days at work quickly passed. There was so much that was new to me, so much which, a which was a challenge. I had found by luck something that interested me, and eventually, after a lot of hard work, I became proficient. I was never a lettering artist, although I could produce a reasonable effort. It was lucky that we had Frank Clements, who did all the lettering in the firm, and he was good at it too. Sometimes, to do small letters, he would cut down a brush handle to make a wedge-shaped tip and use that instead of a brush. It was at colour evaluation that I found I had a natural bent. It never seemed to me to be difficult to assess how much of each colour was needed. 
What I did not have was the strong fingers of Red Passy, who could lay on a three-quarter tint of chalkwork over a large poster plate, plate first time without having to build it up by continuous application of the crayon. His tint work would be so smooth without any patches. It was in 1950 that Chroma Works won the contract to produce the official poster for the Festival of Britain. This was excellent for the firm and a whole range of posters were needed from small underground station posters to the largest 48 sheet posters measuring 200 by 120 inches. Much of the other work printed was a succession of well-known advertisers from Tetley's Beer, Purcell's, Wash, Heinz and British Rail. Annually, Lyons Corner Shop commissioned pictures for their restaurants. What was interesting was that a number of these were the self-drawn works of well-known artists known as autolithographs. Throughout my time as an artist, the basic drawing techniques never changed. To speed up the production of vignettes and increase the brush was sometimes used in day mediums a mechanical tinting device with a raised dot structure stretched over a wooden frame charged with black ink. A pen and ink artwork or architectural drawing could be reproduced photographically that saved drawing by hand. All these methods were adopted to augment the use of chalk and ink. Soon towards the end of the process of hand-drawn work, great efforts were made to stem the tide of the camera taking over. However, in the end, customers wanted the latest techniques to help sell their produce, thinking that to be modern and up-to-date would give them an advantage. Nothing would entice the clients to stay with hand-produced posters. Those changes to the industry to come about when I came out of my time as an apprentice and had served my national service was six years later. In October 1950, I started my indentured period as apprenticeship for one day a week, including the evening I had to go to London School of Printing at Bolt Court, just off Fleet Street, to study the City and Guilds course for lithographic artists. Many of my fellow apprentices had been to the school for their full-time education, having passed an entrance examination. Their knowledge of the industry was far greater. They had the advantage of training in a department that had a long-term future. The majority were photographic colour retouchers. The course was for five years and taught by lecturers who were still there in 1980. They were keen on me continuing with hand drawing and showed great interest in the work that I was doing. I produced a reproduction of a horse and cart in nine colours using hand stipple by pen and ink. This method last produced commercially before the war in the 1920s. It was, even to me, outdated, but I did as I was told. Much later I regretted the waste of time and effort. There was an air of obsolescence about the whole process. It was not just all the other industrial trades affected by modernisation and union disruption. Printing, particularly for London's national newspapers, were beset by labour problems. National newspapers are unique. Their production is geared to the latest story and the fastest deadline. They make their profit on their advertisers who use their vast circulation for maximum coverage of their product. Any disruption in production is critical. Newspaper owners are caught by the threat of a strike, and they always gave in. This gave the letterpress unions a massive power and an enormous pay packet to boot. I had to belong to a trade union, and Chroma Works was a union house, a fact accepted by the management. The legal status for such gatherings of workers did not come about until the mid-1860s, including all trades. The monthly union meetings were held at Doughty Street in London, and all the members took it in turn to attend and report to their colleagues what took place, raise any questions the chapel required an answer to, and to vote in a manner agreed upon. 
The union was organised within printing houses and plate makers in trade groups called chapels, with officials elected annually. The representative for each chapel was called the father of the chapel, who was voted into office, with the rest of the committee annually. It was hoped by keen trade unionists that each member would fill these positions in turn. In reality, all the officials continued until they gave up the position. Most of the business covered was routine, and to a man the chief participants were left-wing socialists. In 1950, the majority of workers were ex-servicemen in favour of Marxist ideology and the means of production. The head office staff also retained their position until retirement, deputies into the shoes of departing leaders. The main union policy or philosophy was one man, one job, using a white car system. Every journeyman was equal to another, and the rule book was the law. The union was there to look after your interests from apprenticeship to retirement. The minimum wage was set annually for a trained member based on the cost of living index. All other wages balanced to this sum, including apprentices paid an incremental proportion. The rule book covered every known instance of dispute, on any in-house dispute between a member and the employees. It was insisted that the chapel would sort it out by self-regulation, and any self-regulating system is flawed by self-interest and lack of far-sightedness. In my experience, there was little regulation. Workers and managements flouted agreements when it suited their interests. Managements were tried of making tried of making profits, meeting deadlines and competing against other firms, markets and new techniques. Workers kept new production techniques and true production time secret whilst protecting the number of jobs and working habits. Employers either extracted unfair profits in good times or didn't have the will to take a moral stand in bad. They were at the mercy of the unions, especially the newspapers, who had a deadline to keep. Minor uni union officials were often dissatisfied men, threatened by their own lack of skill. Their need to control others gave them a feeling of power to make up for their own shortcomings. From 1950 onwards, momentous changes occurred in the printing industry. There was a transfer of work from one printing process to another as advancing technology di dictated. Letterpress, up to 1960, was the process for general printing work. Lithography, the process most suitable for large posters, and photogravure produced all the most popular magazine work. This order of work lasted from the late 30s until the 70s, when lithographic web offset printing took over the large print runs for magazines and newspapers production. Both letterpress and gravure declined, leaving lithography in advance until jet and laser printing made inroads into that in the 90s. While all this was going on, the labour force shuttered, shuttled from one process to another, retraining as it went, trying to keep up with each innovation as it fitted into the production line. Technical colleges couldn't keep pace and training boards floundered. Finally, the unions lost power and the adage of one man, one job went out of the window. Colour scanners and word processors linked to laser printers won out. However, all this was to come about. No one could predict it in 1950. What was to happen in 50 years was to be a revolution for the printing word. My first fifteen wartime interrupted years were now at an end. No great scholastic achievements, few personal attributes unearthed. These moments were for me and for my circle of friends times of childhood innocence, of freedom, security and simple pleasures. In retrospect, they were halcyon days, taken for granted, and as described, doomed not to last. I now realise my generation was very lucky. Discipline, 
responsible behaviour and public order dissolved as the old order changed. In America the lowest common denominator was anything for a fast buck. Here it was, I deserve a living, and became later because I'm worth it. Society now is far more selfish and demanding. The anniversary of Pinch Albert's 1951 exhibition was celebrated a hundred years later. In 1951 the Festival of Great Britain was incorporated to show the world Britain had survived and emerged from the conflict of war with all the skills and trades ready to resume where it had left off to claim its previous held premier position. The site chosen for the festival was the south bank of the Thames which had been badly bombed. Several aerial attacks had left a derelict site close to the centre of London, an ideal place to show what the future would bring and to demonstrate what Britain would, could, be, could do. A joyous expression for a war-weary nation. This exhibition brought about much needed work, especially to those businesses around London. In the event, it was about the same effect as the Millennium Dome.